So good afternoon and happy Earth Day to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this uh, Earth Day celebration featuring uh, Maine's Young Poets. Um, we would love to be with you in person today for this celebration, of course, um, but we're, we appreciate that you uh, were able to join us online here today instead. Uh, we hope that you and your families are safe and healthy during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my name is Todd Martin. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For more than 60 years, NRCM has been protecting the places and the way of life that make Maine so special. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 members and supporters around Maine and around the country. We have a staff of 27 and our office is just across the street from the State House in Augusta. So before we get started with our program this afternoon, I just wanna make a couple of quick notes about the Zoom platform that we're all using today. I'm sure we're all uh, pros with Zoom uh, this, this far along into the pandemic, but just a couple of reminders. Um, so the, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to watch the recording on YouTube uh, tomorrow from me in your inbox. Uh, your video and your audio is disabled this afternoon by design. You'll only be able to see and hear our panelists this afternoon. But if you have a question during the program for any of our poets, um, please type your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen in the, in, the, in the ribbon. And we'll have plenty of times to get to our questions and answers um, after our poets share their work with us. So before I turn it over to our moderator, Sama, uh, and our four youth poets, Ada, Isabel, McKeeley, and Remick, uh, we have a special message to play from Governor Janet Mills. Uh, the governor was unable to join us in, uh, here live this afternoon, but she was kind enough to record an Earth Day message to welcome us here today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we'll hear the governor. Just taking a moment to load. Hello, this is Governor Janet Mills. One evening last summer, I stood by the lake, my head upward, studying the Perseid meteor shower, the ancient debris of starry cadavers that dusted the dark sky. I thought of the interesting poem by Walt Whitman called, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. It goes like this. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Today, while the COVID-19 pandemic has consumed the public's attention and as we put the full force of our will and our wallets behind preserving the economy and preventing death, other public health crises still loom large, unabated, including climate change. In 2019, you know I addressed the United Nations a year and a half ago, telling them Maine won't wait to address climate change. I traveled to Iceland and I spoke to the Arctic Circle Assembly. I told them how Maine had joined the US Climate Alliance to pursue the goals of the Paris Accord. I told them how we had invested in electric vehicles and heat pumps and solar power and sustainable forestry and conservation, and we continued to do that. How we had withdrawn from the Outer Continental Shelf Coalition that promoted drilling off our shores for gas and oil. How we had enacted some of the most ambitious renewable energy goals in the country. 
Above all else, I told them that Maine is committed to accept science without polemic, to mitigate the disastrous effects of greenhouse gas emissions and global climate change on our natural resources, on our economy, on the health and very survival of our citizenry and our planet. Today, we call upon science once again, this time to prevent the spread of a deadly virus that prevents us today from meeting in person. As we study facts and science, though, whether confronting the pandemic or the dangers of climate change, still we look up in wonder at the sky. We take refuge in the woods and waters of our state. We find comfort in nav navigating the rough waves around our islands. We troll quiet streams for trout. We're healed by our state's vast natural resources. And we remember the words of Joshua Chamberlain, who said in 150 years ago, quote, they will love the land and the land will give back strength. And there we do get our strength. And like the author Wendell Berry, we remain still and we listen to the voices that belong to the stream banks and the trees and the rolling fields. Quote, find your hope then, Wendell Berry wrote, quote, on the ground under your feet, your hope of heaven, let it rest on the ground underfoot. The world is no better than its places. Its places at last are no better than the people while their people continue in them, end quote. It's a pleasure to welcome you as people devoted to the preservation of this special place we call Maine to this virtual celebration of Earth Day and a celebration of the creativity and ingenuity of Maine people. I want to thank the Telling Room and the Natural Resources Council of Maine. And I thank your moderator today, Sama, for hosting this event and inviting me to offer a few words of welcome. I thank you for your poetry, for your passion, for your creativity and for your belief that we can protect our natural world as we take a moment occasionally to look up and in perfect silence at the stars. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Excellent. Wow. Well, thanks again to Governor Mills for sharing that message with us. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for the program, uh, Sama, to get us uh, started. Thank you, Todd. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Samat Abdurraqib, and the pronouns I use are she, her, and hers. And I am so excited to be here with, uh, with Remick and Makili and Isabel and Ada and Isabel's Corgi. I love Corgis who just left the room once I started talking. I don't know what that's about. Um, uh, I'm really excited about the poetry we're going to hear, and I'm thankful to the um, to the Telling Room and uh, the National Resource Council of Maine for um, putting this event together. So a bit about the Telling Room, the Telling Rooms, oh, um, I should probably say some things about myself. I'm really bad at introducing myself. Um, I'm the Associate Director of the Maine Humanities Council. Um, I write poetry and um, I do a lot of things around the city of Portland and in the state of Maine. And one of the things that I do is that I am um, a volunteer leader for a national organization called Outdoor Afro. Um, I've been a leader with Outdoor Afro for three years. Uh, and our, the mission of Outdoor Afro is to connect black people to each other through the outdoors and to reconnect black people to the outdoors. And so I lead um, events or trips once a month. Um, and I have been the only leader for the past three years, but we just, um, trained another leader in Maine uh, who lives in Waterville, which is really exciting for me and for the state of Maine and for outdoor Afro. So a bit about the Telling Room. The Telling Room's mission is to empower uh, youth through writing to, and to, to share their voices with the world. And so events like this are one way that the Telling Room's young writers have an opportunity to share their voices. Um, the Telling Room has uh, each year works with about 3,700 students from 100 schools and 75 towns across Maine. Um, over um, 175 books have been published by young writers through the Telling Room. Um, 
Uh, the Telling Room has six after school programs and three school based programs. And the students you're going to hear from today participated in a statewide virtual program called SWARM, which stands for Students, Writers, and Readers Meet. Um, uh, as a volunteer, um, the Telling Room has 175 dedicated volunteers, and um, I'm one of those volunteers. I have volunteered with the Young Writers and Leaders Program, as well as the Young Emerging Authors Program. And so um, the Telling Room is just a wonderful resource. Um, so this is how things are gonna go today. I'm gonna read a poem and then I'm just going to open up the floor to Ada, McKeely, Isabel, and Remick in that order to share their poems. And then I'll um, say some words about their beautiful, powerful poems and um, I will ask them some questions and they'll, they'll respond to some prepared questions. And then just to echo what Todd said, please uh, drop your questions in the Q&A box and I will ask those to our writers at the, at the end of the session. Um, in the Q&A box, hopefully you'll find it, but it's in the bottom toolbar uh, of your Zoom screen. So the poem that I'm gonna read is a poem that I read last year during National Poetry Month for the Auburn Library. Um, and it's a poem that makes me really happy. It's about, uh, um, I'm a big birder and it's about looking for um, a woodpecker in the woods. And I'm very excited to be reading it again during National Poetry Month. Um, the name of this poem is called, What Good is a Hammer? We got so still in the woods together that afternoon crossing the soggy plank that divided the murky, marshy water. I just delighted you with my quick scan spotting of that snake that slithered up from the water and into the moss. You already thought I was magic. Let me show you more. You sentimental collector and cataloger of moments. I am learning. This is what you hold your breath for. Let me show you more. I hear it first because I am always ready. I rush to you my sharp whispered, listen, pushing you into silence and stillness. There it is, back in the trees, deep to the right, there. What is a woodpecker but a rapid staccato drum beat begging your heart to keep pace, I think, as we stand, my hands on your chest, on your heartbeat, my ear on your back, on your heartbeat. Now you hear it too, and everything about you becomes still and alert the way I like it. We are together on this plank, possibility of a new moment somewhere off there if we are lucky. Yes, we will be lucky. We have been thus far in our own past and here in this present. So we set off heads cocked together, but not. It should be right there, but it's not. I am teaching you about their wiliness, about how they throw their voices and their sounds, how they rise above the congruent melodies and then drop below just as you approach. But what good is a hammer if it isn't precise? So we pause at a bend and then we turn left because we will be lucky. Coming to a certain tangle of half dead leaning trees, we stop. It's right above us now, but also behind us and through us, filling our bodies. You see her first, she is right in front of us. I will hold the awe, joy, surprise of your voice in my mind until I can't anymore. You have seen something for the first time. I know that feeling. It takes me a moment, but then, now, I am with you. She is perfect, working so hard on this dead tree, stripped of bark, thin, smooth, tan. She is symmetry and black and white, white dots on her collapsed wings so close together, they're like bars streaked across wings folded across a patch of white I know is there on her back. Beak short, head striped. I know that you are wondering, how can it be? How can a thing so small compel us forward from 60 yards away? But what good is a drumbeat if it doesn't compel? She flies off breaking the spell and you look at me for a beat and I look away as we both chuckle awkwardly. What else is there to say now? As we tumble out of the woods into the small parking lot, you proudly tell a passerby that we've just gone birding. I smile, you haven't seen a thing yet. Let me show you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to uh, 
open it up. So we're gonna hear from Ada, then we're gonna hear from Makili, then we'll hear from Isabel, and then finally we'll hear from Remick. Hello all, my name is Ada Milhauser. I am 13 years old and I'm an eighth grader at Berwick Academy. I wrote this poem in a fall swarm program recently, which was actually my first one. It is titled, There's No One Else to Solve It. You sit down here, sip from cups you know were made to be thrown out. Abundance of these plastic things are tearing the world apart. You drive in cars, emissions in the atmosphere, we cough and burn. These fossil fuels, while less before, are rising and we must refrain. The pandemic, we stay inside, the air quality takes a break. Your children here, dependent on the future you prepare for them. With pesticides and chemicals, their knowledge sinking down, dwindling. But we see it, hear it, know it, and still think there's someone else to solve it. Peering out my window like a squirrel looks outside the tree trunk after the cold, taking in all of the sights, inhaling the cool minty breeze. I would like to cherish this world. I do not wish for plastics absentmindedly thrown out to take this away from me. When you see it, hear it, know it, remember, there's no one else to solve it. Be a small part of progress so we can welcome the big future. Hello, uh, my name is Makili Matty. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm an eighth grader at Shapley School. I've attended two telling room programs, one of which was a school provided program two years ago, and the other was this past summer, and telling rooms program Swarm. This is where I wrote my um, piece, Wintry Waters, a story drafted from Freezing Toes. When the waves first slap at your feet, you could almost just step back, but for some reason, you couldn't find the will. It has something that holds your gaze, the way it feels no limit, the way it flows in and out with no hesitations. Even when the cold's unbearable, it still supports life. Even when it may seem to never calm, it still allows the surest of boats to float on. The ocean seems endless, a vast expanse of blues and grays calling me forth with a lulling of its waves, lapping at my feet. Um, okay. um, my name is Isabel. I'm 10 years old. I will be 11 in seven days. My pronouns are she, her. I love reading, cooking, drawing, writing, and playing music. My poem I'm going to read is called Hope. Animals are lost. The hunter crouches in damp leaves. They wait for an animal to approach. They shoot. Noise shatters the woods. The animal collapses to the floor. Trees are lost. The chainsaw starts. It strains to cut the towering tree. Finally, the chainsaw buzzes to the other side. The lofty tree descends to the forest floor. An iceberg is lost. The iceberg crashes down to the ocean. A wave builds up. It bursts into the other glaciers. They groan into chunks and pieces fall down from the neighboring icebergs. Time is lost. Time is running out. Everything might be irreversible. Humans are found. Every five seconds, a new human is born. More of everything is needed. Houses are found. A load of lumber has just arrived to humans soon to be doorstep. They build their new, very important house. A corporation is found. The human drafts their idea of a perfect corporation. It will be a perfect fossil fuel dispenser. Carbon is found. Every year, tons of carbon is discharged into the air. Soon, there might not be a way to stop it. Love is found, but sometimes lost. It floats away, leaving your mind. If you hope, if you care, if you love. It surrounds you, your mind, everyone, making you feel warm, calm, and happy. Hope can be lost, but is always found. Hope is always with you. It's deep down there when you can't find it. Believe. Hi, my name is Remick Maddie, and I'm a sixth grader in Shapley Middle School. I wrote this in a swarm problem program with my brother this fall. And two years ago, I one year ago, I did a swarm pro a different telling room program for school. This is my poem. Above, 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 below, below, below by Remick Maddie. 
The sun with its heat, the sky forever broken, the magic of the wind. Above, above, above. The rippling water, the endless expanse, the diving fish, below, below, below. The lake going from shore to shore, endless in its glory. You sit there as you take it all in and find how small you really are. A fish in, an, in the ocean, a squirrel in the forest, you're tiny compared to the world. The sun off the water, you look to the sky, the wind in your hair, above, above, above. The moving, flowing water, stretching forever forward. The fish underneath me, below, below, below. Thank you. Thank you all. I hope everyone is um, at their at their respective Zoom screens clapping. I wish that you could see. Uh, you know, we don't have we don't have the reacts because we're in webinar mode. But thank you all very much. Um, so I, I just want to say a few words about these poems. The things that I that I really loved about these poems. Um, I love how all of them have a layers and layers of images and. I like that they are such clear and distinct images. So I'm thinking about um, Isabel's poem with the lumber that's delivered to the soon to be stairs. I love that, I love that line. And the, um, the waves, um, Nikili, that lap at our feet um, and the, uh, the diving fish in your poem, Remick and um, Ada, I just keep thinking about how we're all sipping from these paper cups that we are not these paper cups, but sipping from these cups we know were meant to be thrown out. So I loved all of the images and how just how sharp and clear and distinct they are and how they um, I feel like your poems give really like they they both go like they all go both microscopic and sort of telescopic in terms of the lenses. So you both you all are like looking at very um, you're looking like at something very close up, but then you all kind of pan out and um, are writing about um, oceans, writing about larger things, it's doing both of those things at once in your poetry. I just, I really love them. Um, and all of the powerful, important messages. So thank you. Um, let's get into some Q and A. So these are questions that we um, prepare together. And the poets are just gonna respond in the order that they just read. Uh, so the first, um, so I think all of you shared a little bit about where you wrote the poem, like which program you were in when you first wrote the poem or where you were when you first wrote the poem. Um, but I am curious to hear what inspired you to write the poem. Um, let's start with Ada. Um, the inspiration behind this poem was um, I, this is one of many poems that I've been writing in a collection for a year long project that I started in September. And in each poem in the collection, I'm tackling a different world issue. Um, my family spends a lot of time near the ocean. Um, during the summer, we love to go to Fort Foster, which is the local beach. I have a lot of memories from this park and it, it kind of symbolizes home to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess my inspiration was environment and how we're destroying it. Um, and to know that there's, you can't just hope that it'll go back to normal and it won't fall apart, but you have to hope that you are gonna help, that you will help. Mm. Not mm. Hope, just that you will help. Mm. My family, family is lucky enough to go camping a lot and we went camping at a super remote, well, a pretty remote lake called Flagstaff. And while we were there, we went kayaking. And I wrote the poem based on my time kayaking. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, I loved all those responses. Um, I don't know where that lake is. I'm gonna look it up, Flagstaff. Um, so next question, this is, uh, I feel like writers always get a question about process. So I thought we could, we could go into a question about what your writing process is. So what is your writing process? Do you, whatever you wanna share about that is, um, do you have a favorite notebook you write in or a favorite spot you write in? Um, do you 
with this poem that you wrote, did it come out perfectly the first time or did you have to go back and edit it and revise it? Anything that you wanna share about your writing process in general or about this poem, this particular poem that you, your writing process with this particular poem that you shared? Um, usually when I like to start writing a poem, I like to just sit down at a desk um, near a big window in my house and just focus on the initial process. And for this poem, um, it was a little different because usually I just do free write poems with um, usually their fiction, but this one, I did a little bit of research first and I um, gathered all of my facts and then I turned it into more of a poetic scheme. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, my writing process, process tends to be very fluid. Um, I usually just brainstorm ideas of what to, what to write unless I have a really clear idea in my head as was the case with this poem. Uh, and then I really just like write and I edit along the way. Um, I'm just going to say that it's not easy. I fidget and doodle. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I do like sharing my work, so I do do it. Um, my, I, when I write, I really like to just like curl up on a couch and be comfortable. And then if I'm writing on something, I oftentimes just like write a small bit and then like forget and do, and then write more later. For this poem, I actually wrote the first half of it. And then later I went back and added the second half to make it more full. Those are great process responses. I, that, what you all said just, uh, resonates with me. It makes sense with me too. Like I am, I'm a person like you, uh, Makili, I tend to write and edit as I go along. And, um, I just want to, Isabel, I just want to affirm that sharing poetry, um, is a thing that I have to force myself to do because it is not very comfortable, but I am like committed to doing it. And so I do it. <laughs> I make myself do it. It's not, it's not always very comfortable or exciting for me. For some people it is. Um, oh, I love those responses. Um, I also have a, well, I mean, I can, I try to, I write in a lot of different places, but I have a, um, if I'm writing at home, then I have a favorite chair that is by a window that I tend to, to write in. Um, those are great. Um, people are writing great questions in the Q&A box. Please keep them coming. We will, it looks like we will have ample time to get to some of those questions, to get to those questions. So thank you. Um, the last question that we came up with um, together is, um, why is caring for our environment important to you? And, and um, how, how do you show that you care for our environment if there's anything that you wanna share with, with folks? So why is caring for our environment important to you? And, and how do you show or demonstrate that you care about our environment, Ada? Um, well, here at the Berwick Academy Middle School, I um, have the honor of being the community service leader, and there is also an environmental leader, and she is a wonderful person, and she's organized um, beach cleanups, and I, Bulldogs Go Green is what we call a club here at Berwick Academy, where um, we have a bunch of posters that we've made, and we've set them up all around the middle school, just bringing awareness for the environment. Hmm. I have um, a lot of opportunities to go places that are still wild and natural, and I feel this is a um, this is a chance everyone should get, even future generations. Uh, when I was in sixth grade, I, I helped organize a club called the Mad Club, which was still still active until the pandemic hit. Um, but Mad stands for Make a Difference, and the focus of the Mad Club was to generate ideas to help fight against global warming. Mm -hmm. um, the I, the environment and caring for the environment is important to me because I think we need a healthy environment because it's like, I love nature and um, I don't think we can really live on earth if we don't have a healthy environment. And um, 
a healthy environment. My um, my parents have a hybrid car. I donate to organizations that help. I try not to buy a lot of stuff. I compost and recycle, and I try to get compostable stuff. That's great. Um, our family recently went on a beach cleanup, and I was shocked by how much trash mm. we found on that beach. Mm -hmm. And also, um, our family does not use wrapping paper. We make our own cloth bags and use those for presents instead. And I feel that if we don't help our environment, eventually there won't be anything to help. Hmm. Right on, those are great. Those are great responses and great examples of um, all the work that you're doing around environmentalism, around sustainability. Um, thank you. So um, now let's turn our attention to questions that are coming in from the audience. And so the way that we'll do this is I'll just, I'll read the question and whoever, um, you know, take as long, you know, take a moment to, to think about the response if you want. Um, I'm sure you all can, you know, the poets, you all can see the questions as well, but um, whoever wants to respond, just come off mute and not everyone needs to respond. There's no obligation. Um, and we'll just see how it goes. So the first, the first, a couple of people have asked this question that I, I'm wondering if, um, I don't know the answer to, and so I'm wondering if there are folks here from the telling room who might be able to um, put something in the chat to all the attendees and the, and the panelists um, in response to this question. But um, a couple of people have asked whether or not um, they would be able to have access to these poems. So and writes, might we someday have these poems written so that they can um, read them? And Karen asked the same thing about having a copy of the poems, a print copy. I don't know the answer to that question. Do any, do you poets know the answer to the question? Well, there is um, always the Swarm book. I don't know how to get access to that, but there's that. Okay. This is the Swarm book. Ooh, so and tell. Very nice. It doesn't just have our poems in it, though. It has tons of poems. It's just a way Ooh. to get some of them. But it has these poems that you've just read in them? It has mine and my brother's. I'm not sure about. This one has my poem. OK. OK. And it looks like Kristen is going to send out an email so they can to tell, let people know how to access the Swarm book. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Amy's question. Um, where is your favorite place to write? I think that some people, I think that Remick answered that question, but if do other people have favorite places to write? I don't have one particular favorite spot, but um, I tend to just like to be comfortable and just let my ideas flow and then I can edit grammar and that as I go, but just, just to get as much on that piece of paper as I possibly can. Um, yeah, same thing for me. Like Makili, I like to be in a comfortable space, um, usually a quiet one. And as I said earlier, I have a desk, which, um, it's a very quiet space in my house and it's next to a big window where I like to find a lot of inspiration. Um, I guess my favorite spot is any place that isn't loud. Mm. Okay, there's a, there are a couple more uh, questions about writing. So let's get to those first. And then there are people who've asked some questions about um, pollution and climate change and, and um, the impact of poetry on those things. So I'll ask those in a, in a, in a minute. Karen wants to know about, um, did you, were you all poets before you started taking the, the, the workshops, the classes before you were enrolled in the telling room programs? So poetry is um, my, personally my favorite um, form of writing. 
And it also like poetry, in my opinion, is very similar to music where you can do whatever you want. And it's, it's your, it's basically an express, your own expression. Other folks, were you writers before the telling room? Oh, before you got involved with the telling room or poets? One time I got like super excited and tried to write like a really big book. I only made it for through like two chapters before I like, but I've written small stories, like short stories for like about random things about my experiences. Um, I sometimes would make haikus because just random haikus about random things. And um, I when one time, many times tried to make a story, it, it didn't work out, but. Has anyone else, is anyone else, um a story writer or is it just mostly poetry? Story writing is, um, is, is, is also very fun to write, but it's not as flowing. Um, it's, it's not as, it's not as you can't, you can't do as much with storytelling as you can with poetry. Poetry just has like a feel of it that story writing doesn't quite capture. Mm. Yeah, I agree. When I was younger, I used to write a lot of short stories and poetry. And it's just a, it's just a, yes, I, I agree, um, Makili, like the, the flow of it is different and there's the constraints feel a little bit different. Like you, when I was, when I would write short stories, I would feel like, oh, I have to resolve this thing. With poetry, you can just kind of like leave things slightly unresolved or like slightly uncomfortably settled you know um yeah and and poetry you only say what you what you really mean story writing you have to develop a story po poetry you you just say what you want that's right i personally like reading better than writing like i like yeah. what other people have to say hmm I like them both equally, but reading is sometimes easier than writing. Any other, other kinds of writing that, that you all do? Um, Rose wants you all to know that, you all, that you're awesome. <laughs> um, How did you all find out about the telling room? So two years ago, the um, the telling room came to uh, Shapley School as like a, a school. I'm not sure if it was school funded. I'm pretty sure it was a school funded program that allowed teachers to um, give students the opportunity to basically have their writing published on a school wide basis. And um, I I was nominated for that, and that really is what got got me really interested in um, writing and the telling room. I also did the school based um, telling room program, and in that program, you every single person they give you a genre, and you get to write whatever a story based in that genre, whatever you want. Was the question how you found out about Telling Room or Swarm? Telling Room. Okay, so my friend's mom works there, or I think works there, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I did like a writing and yoga camp, and then I did Swarm. Mm. 
Um, for me, sorry. when I was really little, um, my mom noticed that I really liked to start getting into writing more. So she introduced the telling room to me. And I think she heard it from a friend. And when I moved a little bit farther away from the telling room, I was um, pretty sad that I wasn't able to attend any more programs. But then when I found out that I could attend Swarm on Zoom, I was really excited. Oh, that's so, that's so fantastic, Ada. Like I think, well, pandemic has given us, has, the pandemic has given us many things that I wish we didn't have to have, but Zoom does make things, make so much more accessible. And so I'm so excited that that's how you were able to get connected again. Um, Amy wants to, is asking about revision. So she says, she asks, when you try to revise a poem, what's the hardest thing about revi revision? Also, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten as a poet? So all poems need revision before they're published. Um, and I find that the best way to revise a poem is to really just read it over and over again um, until you can basically speak it out of memory. And then, and then you really get to, then you really contemplate the wording and the meaning of the poem um, on a deeper level and you can make edits to what you, what you want, basically. Mm, the best advice I've been given is to use more sensational words, to hmm. use words that would like make you be in the story, the poem, instead of just hearing it. Hmm. Use, using imagery. Imagery and sensational words. Ada? Um, a really nice piece of advice that I've received um, was from Amy Kimball actually, and it was take your poem and read each line and make sure that each line individually sounds like a poem in itself. Mm. I thought that was really helpful to bring it all together. Hmm. I have never done that before. Hmm. Hmm. Isabel, any, what's the hardest thing about revision or, and, or, um, what's the best piece of advice you've gotten as a poet? I, um, I actually don't know. Revision's just, I don't like revising. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, revising is actually, I agree with you, uh, Makili, that you, you know, before it's published, it's it's important to revise it and to let other people see it, I think, before you publish it uh, or before you send it out for publication. But revising is hard sometimes because it comes out and you're like, this is it. And it's just hard to look back at it and, and try to change what was like fully formed in your head or whatever. Um, sometimes okay. I, sometimes yeah. I read back on my published work and I'm like, ooh, I really, really should have changed that. Do you ever feel like that? I do. Ada is saying yes, she does. And it's out there, but I do, I do. Um, okay, uh, let's pivot just a little bit um, and move, shift to these questions that are, um, that are about climate change and environmentalism. Um, all right, Lisa asks, how do you experience hope in this world and in the face of so much pollution and climate change? That's a big question. So every, every little thing that you can do, whether it's composting, um, um, com what's the word I'm looking for? God. Um, Okay, I can't think of the word. Someone else should answer the question while I think. Okay. I am happy to read it again once I find it. Okay, how do you experience hope in this world in the face of so much pollution and climate change? Um, for me, when I do notice like um, uh, like a piece of plastic on the ground in the park or when I notice someone littering or um, just realizing pollution, I have the hope that because I'm a writer, we can use 
words and writing to um, get word out. And just, um, I think the hope is that just bringing awareness and realization will hopefully um, change perspective in people and change um, how they see the world and that every little thing counts, as Nikili was saying. Mm -hmm. I feel that the, I can do it because there's still some people that are willing to stand up and if enough and if enough people join them we might be able to do something mm -hmm. contribution that's what i was looking for anything you contribute to help to help to help the fight anything you do helps that's the truth Isabel, how do you find hope in the face of I said it for me like I can't really think of anything to say now because it's like everyone else said sort of I, I, I can find something to say because I everyone else said it that's all right. It sounds like you strongly agree. You strongly concur. Yeah. I mean, I think um, people who know me or who hear me say things, I, <laughs> I often say that I'm not an optimist because I'm not. I'm not. But um, if anyone's ever read Between the World and Me by ta Coates, that book resonates a lot with me, mostly because we are roughly the same age and we grew up in the same kind of cultural moment. And he is not an optimist and he, um, um, but he says, you know, you, you, you struggle anyway because towards justice or towards whatever it is, because that's, that's what we, that's what we are here for and change does happen even if it is incremental and small. And I, so I'm not an optimist in terms of like, oh, one day things will be, you know, will will be 180 degrees different will be better i just believe that small that change happens and i also believe that humans we are very adaptable beings so we all have the capacity for change i mean just think about the ways that we have all adapted to living so many of us have adapted to living in this pandemic these pandemic times like we pivoted very very efficiently and so so all of the all of the changes that I hear all of you talking about, um, and all of the Nikita, what was the word contributions that people can like you know we can do those things, we can do those things, and they impact. There's a quote that I um, really like that sums up a lot of this, and it's I don't know who wrote it, but the only thing permanent is change. Hmm. And going back to what Samath said about um, how some people will say, um, they'll be extreme optimists and say, oh, one day everything is just gonna do a full 180 and everything will be better. I think that hope, that hope has to come with action. Um, so um, I'll go back to a quote from my poem that I just read, um, be a small part of progress so we can all welcome the big future. I think um, like Nikili said, you have to contribute. And that's a big part of this all, this hope that we all have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I um, am really interested in the response to Gus's question because um, I went to, let's see, I graduated high school in 1994 and we did not, we did not talk about these things in school. So I'm very interested. So Gus asks, what kind of climate change education have you had in your schools? Um, they're curious, Gus is curious about whether or not it's through science or art or through an after school club or something else um, school based. But have you been getting climate change education in your schooling? I think that the, the climate change education is really limited um, and lacking. We, we really don't get that much education. And if we do, it's it's, it's like a, a special host may come in and give us a, a lecture, but it's, it's not, it's not as, it's not as, it's more important than what education makes it out to be. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. With us, it is normally the teachers aren't the ones that like tell you stuff. 
with us, um, like we're doing a project where we get to pick something to research and it could be like polluting the oceans or endangered animals or climate change, but mm -hmm. they don't actually teach us it. We get to learn about it ourselves. So it's less being taught and more get being given the opportunity to learn. Yeah, yeah. so in that situation, the desire has to come from you as the student to, to investigate, to learn more. Okay. I cut someone off. Who was? Um, I, I don't really know where I got a lot of education from it, but I know my school is really good about the global warming, like education. Um, same for um, us, I think that the awareness kind of, kind of comes around on Earth Day and like throughout this week and we have assemblies, but I think that the rest of the year, we need that same awareness that we have during this time of Earth Day. And I think that that's where the teaching needs to come around. And like Remick said, um, I think most of it will come from students and peers. Mm -hmm. I love that response, Ada. Bring that same energy that you have today on Earth Day. Bring it 365. Same energy. Yeah. Um, so let's see, let's see, let's see. Molly, where's Molly? Okay. Molly um, asks, should the Telling Room publish a book on environmental awareness or nature writing or both or two books? Um, what do you what do you all think? I think that any contribution to um, climate crisis awareness is important. Um, there's a really good resource out there um, that is also that is it's called the story of stuff. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. And that that like is another really good resource that I mean, if we had more resources like that, we we might have more awareness of climate change. Any other thoughts? Should the Telling Room publish a, a book on environmental, on environmentalism or nature writing or both? Yes, you should, but you should, like it would be better to get input from all over instead mm -hmm. of just here so that you could say, this is what, we got this from everywhere and everybody is saying that we should. This is a global crisis and input from, from the globe should be um, contributed. That is an excellent, excellent point, Remick. Um, I think we got time for a couple of more. Um, so I think this one might be, I hope you poets are reading the Q and A if you, if you can. I mean, you don't need to do that right this second, but um, because people are saying wonderful, lovely things about you all as poets and as activists and as human beings, and you should see those things. Some of them are directed specifically to, to you by name and some of them are more general about your glowiness. So I hope you're reading those things. Um, Nancy, oh, I love this question. Nancy asks, uh, or Nancy believes that poetry and the arts can help with fighting climate change. Um, and they want to know, Nancy wants to know, how do you all see poetry helping? And I like this question because I think that Isabel started to answer it or Isabel kind of gave a bit of an answer. Um, but I would love to hear what all of you have to say. How does, how can poetry help fighting climate change? Because when you write poetry and read poetry, it shows people that you care and it makes them like look into why you care and that can make them care. And the more people that care about this, the more people will do something. And the more people that do something, 
the greater change we can make. Um, yeah, poetry is your voice. Oh, sorry, Isabel. Poetry is your voice, and the more people who express their voice, um, the more the more change we're going to see. Go ahead, Isabel. It, you like wrote, write poetry from your heart, so it's like very meaningful. Um, one thing I love about poetry and using it to send a message is that um, poems can be very simple and organic and using not like a whole page to send a message. I think using a few words to raise awareness for a very big issue is um, it can be very powerful. Thank you. I'm putting. Um, so. This I just dropped something into the into the chat. This is a from Gus um, Goodwin, and I cannot, I do not have a response to that question. So I'm hoping that someone from the telling room um, can see it and can respond to it, perhaps. Um, lots of thanks. I know there was another question in here. Okay, back to this will be the last question, I think. Um, okay, Linda is a teacher and they ask, has a teacher ever influenced your writing style, your writing topic or your writing voice? Um, and Linda thinks that you are simply wonderful and inspiring. So have you ever been inspired by a teacher? The first telling room program I did, which was two years ago, it was a school um, based program. Um, I had a, um, a wonderful, a wonderful, a wonderful in, uh, instructor. Um, her name was Amy. And um, she really, she really shaped um, how um, the structure of my writing now and it, it really had a huge impact on me. Yes, I think my teachers like if it hadn't been for them, I wouldn't be writing how I did. Like the way I write, I write, I don't really know how to explain how I write, but I feel like it was definitely impacted by the people around me. Um, also in a, the SWARM program, Amy, um, like McKeeley, um, she was very helpful in my revision stages because um, as like sort of a default, um, my poetry is um, line after another and they're all the same length and they all kind of sound the same. But I think um, she really helped me to get a grasp of like structure and that every word um, where it's placed counts. Isabel, was there a teacher who inspired you? It's okay if no. I'm looking at your face. I'm like, oh, maybe the answer is no. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, Ada and McKinley, are you talking about um, uh, Amy Rayner, who was a, an instructor at the telling room? A teacher there? Maybe you don't know their last name. I don't quite remember her last name, but she's very active in the telling room. Um, I think, um, well, I know for me personally, I was talking about Amy Kimball. Kimball. Amy Kimball, that's great. Um, I think, let us see. Um, yeah, I remember being inspired by my, a teacher. Oh, I get the grades confused sometimes, but I think I was in ninth grade. No, I was in 10th grade. Um, and I had a teacher who I wrote. Uh, a poem in like my humanities class and she encouraged me to um, submit it for like a school-wide competition and she encouraged me to submit it for like local co local competitions um, and yeah she was really influential her name was um, Vicki Saunders and for those of you who remember this she looked like Sandy Duncan some of you might remember Sandy Duncan <laughs> um, I think that's it 
Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to, if Todd's going to come back, but I want to thank you all for being here. I want to offer deep, deep gratitude to Remick, McKeeley, Isabel, and Ada for sharing your words and for sharing all of your brilliant thoughts and um, experiences and ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saman, and thank you to all of our youth poets as well. Um, this is the end of our program. Um, happy Earth Day, and thank you all very much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.